So, folks, I'm sitting here next to Kenny Miller, the great Kenny Miller. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here with you today, sir. Thank you so much for taking some of your time Thank to you. be here. Uh, now, we, uh, you, a lot of people don't know this about you, but there was a period in the 1960s that you had the largest teen heartthrob fan club in the United States. Can you tell us about what that was like? Oh, that, that was unreal. It was an exciting time in my life because I was very lucky. to. That period was the time when the teenage movies came into being and uh, and back then they had these wonderful things called fan magazines and I was like uh, well they called me the prince of the fan magazine because we used to uh, with other actor friends of mine we used to make bets who was going to have the most stories in the, or on the covers and all that you, stuff. Uh, you made some great ways for yourself you were in several TV series you were on uh, American Bandstand, Fathers Knows Best and you got to work with Orson Welles in Touch of evil. Uh, you were a uh, gringo, the, the Mexican uh, no good neck. <laughs> what, what was it like working with, uh, with Janet Lee, with Mercedes McCambridge, with, uh, with Orson Welles? Well, that was a wonderful experience, of course, you know, and, and Orson Welles, it, he was so wonderful to me. He signed, I was signed before any of the other, other character people because he wanted me to have curly hair because back then you know they they used to have a thing called the DA and all that stuff and so he put me under con they put, universal put me under contract and got the the, the factors max factors boys to to uh, give me a permanent and it was so funny we went to after it was done after a couple of days and they thought it was right why they said well we're going to take you over to see mr wells in his cottage and his makeup and cottage and i went over with him and i walked the door and he you know he's so he was very robust to yeah. say the least and had this beamy voice well he roared laughing so hard like what in the world are you trying to do? He looks like Gorgeous George. <laughs> and Gorgeous George was a wrestler yeah. who had all this blonde curl. And he, he said, take him back and fix him up right. <laughs> you know, I'll never forget. He was such a wonderful man. And one other thing about that Orson that was great. I got a call from our assistant director, Chico Day, who was Latino. Said, uh, Mr. Wells wants you to go with us. We're going down to look at some of the gangs down in East LA, which is the ghetto of Los Angeles. And uh, he just wants you to go along because you're going to be the he the head of the gang, and, and supposedly, and all. And I said, they want me to go? And he said, yeah. So I came into the studio, and here come the limo and all that. And we went down into L.A., and it was so funny because they would roll down the window, and Mr. Wells, with his voice, would say, would you like to be in a motion picture? And they hey, man, what the hell are you talking about, Jack? I don't know what you're talking about. And then Chico, of course, was Latino, so he would speak to them in Spanish. And, of course, they didn't know who Orson was. Wells with a pile of coal, you right. know. So, but it, I, but that's the kind of and he got. Of course, he loved doing it. And he hired all the extras to come to Universal and paid them to, to be the, the gang and so forth in that movie. So and it was it, a yeah, very similitude because there was really gang members yeah. in the film. <laughs> well, they had to put on extra security at, at the Universal because, you know, some of them had sticky fingers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what can you tell me about working on a, one of my favorite films that you're in, and a lot of people recognize you from this, the great I Was a Teenage Werewolf for Herman Cohen, and you're, of course you're Vic in it, and you, you almost play the bongos. <laughs> That's true. I... I, I learned to play the bongos from Jack Costanza, who's one of the great bongo players in the world then at that time. And uh, he was g going to come to, to dub when they scored the film uh, and, and, uh, and score the bongo playing. Well, and so I learned to fake it, but I couldn't play because I wasn't a member of the musicians' union. I wasn't a... Oh, okay. so that's why you're slapping the edge of the... The edge. Oh, okay. But the thing is, the movie was so... They, it was gone over budget, and it was such a... It was a cheap movie. Uh, I, I mean, as far as money is concerned. Right, right. And, uh, and so I just faked the whole thing and they didn't dub it because it cost too much money to get Jack Costanza to come in and to do it. So... I, if you see that when you see the movie and really listen it's like i'm the the conga the, the bongos don't sound like bongos to me <laughs> the same other thing when i sang eeny meeny miny it's a little off yeah it's off because we we did it without any music because oh, okay, right. usually they pre-record and you lip sync right. to them
Well, this big movie, they said, well, they couldn't afford to bring the orchestra in. At that, you know, they would do it all at one time. Mm -hmm. And so when Paul Dunlap, the music director, I don't know what was wrong with him that day that they did that, but it's like two beats out of sync. Yeah. And we had a Hollywood premiere, teenage premiere, uh, at the 20th, uh, 20th Century Fox Theater, and I had a lot of my friends, you know, like like Connie Stevens and and people that were singers too, in the back of the theater. The rest was all kids, and when the song came on, of course the crowd went crazy. You know, they love and they're yelling. So. You, but I, I said, oh my, my God, and Connie was sitting next to me and she said, Kenny, there's something wrong with the sound, it's out of sync. And I said, I know, something, I could have crawled out oh, on my belly. Yes. And Herman Cohen said to me as we were leaving the theater, I said, Herman, that, you know, oh, we're going to fix that. It only costs a couple hundred dollars. We're going to fix that. They never, I went, I was in Paris, I had gone to the Cannes Film Festival for another film, and I was in Paris and it had been playing for a year at one theater. And I said, I want to go see myself in French and hear, and hear the song, you know. So I went, and of course I am talking, and, and, and Marley, it's so funny, and Michael Landon was, <laughs> but it, anyway, anyway, the song comes on and, of course, they don't dub songs. It costs too much right, right. money. So they're it's still out of sync. Still out of sync. <laughs> you know, it's, well, well, it's it's a cross I have to bear. Yeah. I tell you, so I just did it here the other night. They asked me to do the song, and I said, well, at least you're going to hear it in sync anyway. Yeah. And we had great fun because I had a good. Band. I saw you do it a couple of years ago as well, and you were up there doing the twist at the same time. And a lot of people don't know, but the twist. Part of the reason the popularity of the twist is that you were one of the first people to perform it. Right. Exactly. I, I was one of the, in fact uh, I was uh, working out of New York then and uh, I had a, a manager from New York and was uh, very close to Dick Clark and, and his wife then and he used to come up there a lot because you know New York's very close because we did American Bandstand in Philly mm -hmm. and so on and uh, I was going with a, a wonderful rock singer named Joanne Campbell who we had the same manager and uh, we discovered the Peppermint Lounge down on 45th Street which it wasn't a popular place. It was a dump. I mean, it was part of an old hotel, which I think was mostly catering for prostitutes and so forth. But anyway, so we were talking to Dick this one time. and said, Dick, we got to take you to this place where they do this thing called the twist. And he said, what is it? You know, he never heard of it either. And we took him. We had to go through the, the lobby to get in because, you know, people recognized Dick more than he did me or Joanne or anybody and anyhow that's and, and, and Joey D and the Starlighters were appearing there and we got involved in, and Dick thought it was great and of course eventually he got j j recording contract for Joey D with Roulette Records and uh, that was the beginning of really the, the twist before Chubby Checker or anybody else, you know. And we did it on American Bandstand and all that stuff. You worked for Mr. Big, uh, Bert I. Gordon, in a movie called Attack of the Puppet People. You were a Lilliputian. <laughs> Your name was Stan. Now, uh, I, I understand that there was a pretty uh, hairy situation. There was a, a stunt that involved you crawling up to a doorknob in the film. Uh, that, that, we got in some of the, but you know, Bert Gordon is such a genius. I mean, and back then everything was made real. I mean, there was no, uh, no, no animation or anything like that. And I had to climb up a door supposedly because I was only 12 inches high to the doorknob. To That's right. You're the lookout in the yeah, film. Yeah. To look out and so forth. It's 30 feet high, the top of the soundstage, and and the, these huge ropes that you had to climb up. Oh, it was so painful. Good. Our backs, well, poor old John Ager, he had to climb up the telephone pole, you know, and, yeah. and he, he could hardly move the next day. But anyway, going up, I wore very tight pants in that movie because that was the way everybody wore very tight pants, I think. But anyway, and I'm halfway up and there's no sound and I'm going up and I said, Bert, I think my pants are splitting in the back. And he said, huh? Keep going, keep going. And I kept going, I kept, you know, could hear it. And I was saying, and I yelled without turning around. 
Bert, my pants are split in the back. And he says, well, are you wearing underwear? <laughs> and I said, well, of course I'm wearing underwear. And he said, keep going. <laughs> I went clear to the top, and I got to the top, and the pants were split. And as I'm reaching for the doorknob, it started going, eh, coming loose. Oh, and so I'm yelling and saying, it's going to, the doorknob's coming off. And so they ran and got can, a big canvas and a lot of the grips. And I got part way back down, and then it came off. And, and I mean, I was like two or three steps, I was still holding on, and the doorknob came off. And it, of course, they weren't shooting then, but anyway, but uh, we, we had some uh, harrowing experiences in that movie. What was it like working with John Agar? Now, I've heard so many stories that he was such a pleasant man to be around, not, not a Hollywood type at all, just a guy who just, he was an actor, I guess. You know, he got kind of thrust into it almost and figured. I, you know, he was one of the nicest men, and he's so unactorish and such a gentle man. I don't think he ever really wanted to be an actor, but he was thrown into it because he was like a war hero. And then he, of course, married Shirley Temple, and he became a celebrity and so forth, and he was just thrown into it. But he did it, and he just did one movie after the other and just walked through it and everything, but did a good job. He was dedicated and all that, but he was so pleasant to work with. I never heard him, that when he was climbing up, up, up the... Uh, the telephone, you know, to get up to, to try to make a phone call, it, and over, hand over, you know, it, it, he tore a lot of muscles in the back of his, and the next day he could hardly move, and he had, and this, so they did call a chiropractor and get him, uh, uh, what do you call, it, taped up and all that, but he never complained. He went right ahead and worked, and it was painful because I know I did part of it too you know that same type of thing and it it really hurts you know but he never complained he just did his job and he was happy to be doing it and no fuss about anything he just was so he was a great guy and you've also performed with a, a group called uh, was Davy and the Neptunes is that right which uh, and this was this is they were an opening act for you is this right in the mid 60s no, they weren't really an opening act we had the same uh, recording manager in EMI stateside and uh, the guy who was the lead, we, we hung around together and did some shows together and so forth. But they weren't opening act. They had did, did their own thing and so forth. And funny enough, uh, his name was Davy Jones. And then all of a sudden, uh, and he just couldn't make it. Shell Talmy was my recording manager who discovered The Who, Chad and Jeremy, so many people. And he was an American, but he had moved to London, and now he's back in California now, and I get to see Shell uh, a lot, too. But anyway, uh, this Davy Jones, we became really good friends, had a lot of fun, went to the pubs sometime, and he used to sing outside of theaters and put his guitar down, and people would throw money, and he would sing. And he, he wasn't a name or anything else. Well, later, years later, I lost track of, of David, of Davy, and uh, one day I was talking to Anne, who was Shell's uh, secretary, and I was in London to do a show, to do a, an autograph show like this one here, Monster Bash, and I said, whatever happened to Davy? She said, Kenny, are you, do you live under a rock? And I said, no, you don't know what happened to Davy? And I said, no, I don't, or I wouldn't ask you, I'd like to see him. She said, well, Davy is David Bowie now. Well, that was unbelievable because I'd seen David Bowie and Davy had changed completely because he used to be kind of plump and had long, he had blonde curly hair. I can't picture it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and then here is this guy who's so thin and gaunt and you know everything. This and it's David Bowie he was the guy. Well, I record one of the songs I re first recorded for EMI State Stateside is called Take My Tip, and it was written by David Jones. But it was David, and I said, well, it's too bad they didn't put David Bowie, because my fans would have loved that, because that's that's who wrote it, yeah. and for me, which was great, yeah. yeah. yeah that's a good story. So uh, you also did another film a little bit later on um, called, uh, what was it, The Night, Night Daniel Died, also known as Bloodstalkers? Yes, right. You uh, had a gruesome death scene in this film. Oh. Uh, you were you were top building it. Uh, do you have any recollections or experiences about the about the making of the film? It's a very different film than what you had appeared yeah, in previously right. in your career. 
Well, there again, I was very lucky. Bob Morgan wrote the script for me. And it was shot all in Florida. Unfortunately, in July, in the Everglades, with the flies and the deer flies and the mosquitoes, and, oh, was like hell on wheels. I mean, it was riding around in that area was just terrible. But uh, it 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 was a, a fun movie, and I loved my part. I played an ex singer and a nightclub singer, and so forth. In it, and I had a, a a darling girl who uh, was my wife in the movie and uh, we had a lot it was a lot of problems and my 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 dog I had a little schnauzer uh, Christina who was also in the movie she didn't play my dog she played the other couple's dog but she gets she gets billing in the film and everything else but uh, and she gets killed oh terrible yeah and, uh, most people get killed in the yeah, film <laughs> yeah well they even i said no they they, they were going to not give her a pill to knock her out because they cut her you know put stuff right. on her throat and, right. all. and i said no you you can't and they said well we're going to get a, a veterinarian is going to come out and and take care of her and be blah 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 and it won't hurt her and she'll only be out for and they flew out to the set from Miami this you know because I wouldn't and it was so wonderful she was such an actress I tell you <laughs> she, she's like her old man <laughs> but she, and, and they, she, they gave her the pill and, she, and they questioned me everybody so quiet you know and they did the take and, the, and, and he's quiet and he's counting the, the director's counting one two, and he said cut and she and shook her head and all the blood and crap came off because she knew she had done her she had done her big number you know it was really funny it, it really was. but there, there's some of the special effects like I I get killed by a sickle being crossed thrown across the room which they did and you can't see the wires or anything and it it, it, re, it really really works but it was really uh, there was a very gruesome gruesome movie but I got to tell you this one thing we're in the Everglades and there are alligators everywhere right and there's an old beat up bar in the middle <clears throat> of Loop Road, it's called. When a lot of people, even uh, homeless people, live out in that area, it's not a very nice place to be at night anyway. And there are alligators everywhere. When I went to see the movie, would you believe they were going to go and do second location stuff? There's not one alligator in the whole movie. <laughs> Talk about easy production value for you know for free, just waiting there. Yeah. But it, but it, but it is, and it it has quite a following. It and when I go to do the shows, there's always people that want photos and whatever from from blood stalkers. It's it, it's changed to blood stalkers from the night Daniel died, which I like that name anyway. Yeah. When it was sold to television, because it is better for the people who like that the kind of horror it's, uh, film it's a it's a it's a fitting name but it's not as romantic i suppose as uh, no, the night no. daniel died no. yeah. well you know i i really anybody who's watching this if you ever get a chance to meet kenny miller and to see him perform highly recommended he's an absolute delight as you can tell it's been a, it's been a real pleasure kenny yeah, thank you i've really enjoyed it very i much. have to thank you. thank you so much terror transmission